So today I'm going to be doing another video, uh, another politics video. I mean, I haven't really done a video like this in a while. I haven't really posted uh, things like this on my channel in like since last year. But I felt kind of compelled to uh, make this video and post it based on last night's election results in Virginia and New Jersey and uh, all local races all across the country, including my home state of Maryland. So... As you so yeah, as you all know, the big race last night was the Virginia governor race between Ralph Northam, the lieutenant governor, and Ed Gillespie, the former RNC chairman and uh, 2014 Senate nominee there. And uh, I made the video yesterday saying that while while Northam was favored to win, like by a 60% to 40% uh, odds margin, uh, Gillespie victory was not out of um. You know, out it wouldn't be um, if Gillespie won, it wouldn't be out of surprise. And um, yeah, so this happened. So well, before I go, I show you the uh, actual the county results. I mean, you could see how, generally speaking, this race was close, and people thought that if Northam was gonna win, which he eventually did, uh, that you know it wouldn't be like by like this much. Only Quinnipiac, the outlier in this whole group, was correct, actually. They predicted North Movement by nine points, and credit to the outlier that, uh, you know, the outliers were sometimes correct. So, that was that. Um, and the actual county results are right here. So, yeah, as I said North in the, in the video yesterday, Northern Virginia basically decides everything, and it basically did. So, you see Prince William County here. Uh, keep in mind, Gillespie did really did fairly well with, uh, in Northern Virginia. This is Loudoun County, he where he actually carried this three years ago in the Senate bid. He lost by twenty. In Prince William County, he almost won it. I don't remember the exact margin, but uh, he got walloped. Fairfax, uh, he he lost by seventeen three years ago. Well, he lost two to one here. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember what exactly it was in the city itself. But yeah, it, 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 the point being is it was not uh, pretty here, actually. I can kind of sc okay, Arlington, Northam got 80. Uh, Alexander got, he got 78. Yeah, yeah, that's all. Let me show you. And, you know, Richmond, you know, did another solid. And he, Northam even managed to win Virginia Beach, which is, which is favoring Republicans. And he did that by a, uh, basically a five-point margin. 150, basically 52 to 47 there, and you know, I did did pretty well in the Hampton Roads area. The only thing Gillespie did that he was supposed to do was uh, really do well out here in in Western Virginia, and he got the numbers that he needed to get here. But the problem is, it's just that Northern Virginia, that all the everything else just did not work in his favor. And for Republicans, I mean, granted this race was a gut punch. But it got a hell of a lot worse down the ballot. Uh, Justin Fairfax beat Joe Vogel by about six points here. Uh, similar dynamic, basically. Although, it, I mean, well, Vogel actually did carry Virginia Beach. And, you know, she, she was a little bit more competitive in these areas. But, again, uh, she didn't really outrun Gillespie that much. And uh, in the Attorney General's race, uh, Mark Herring versus John Adams. Mark Herring won re-election to a second term. Uh, you know, again, didn't, like, exactly outperform Northam in all these areas, but he, he still did did pretty pretty good. I mean, he, he did nearly manage to win Virginia Beach, and, yeah, he did well in the Hampton Road areas. Uh, you know, he won Norfolk. Virginia. I mean, yeah, he, he they, the Democrats basically did what they had to do and they always and they had the easier path in this race to begin with but the reason why as republicans it's disheartening it's because we everyone thought that well the republicans thought that ed gillespie represented the last best chance for this foreseeable future mind you for virginia to flip back to the red side and you know that just didn't happen last night i think you know everyone says virginia is a pro state well Basically, it's now a solidly Democratic state, and yeah, sure, the margins are going to be sketchy for Democrats at times, but this is a state where it's going to vote Democratic, mainly because of Northern Virginia and uh, the Northwark area and the Richmond area, and there's just not enough votes out there in the rural areas to do this. And Gillespie outrun, outran Trump, Trump's uh, 
performance. Well, not in the actual vote totals. Again, this isn't off your race. This isn't. This wasn't presidential turnout. But it's worth knowing that this was higher turnout from four years ago uh, when it was uh, McAuliffe versus uh, King Cuccinelli, and McAuliffe won. He's the outgoing Democratic governor, and just yeah, just. It was uh, it was bad, but it gets worse for Republicans down here. Um, this is the House of Delegates. Republicans uh, win tonight uh, with a 66 to 34 majority, uh, two to one, uh, one shy of a vote override. Yeah, Democrats are basically on the verge of taking the House. Although I, it depends on how a few recounts shape out. Uh, it's generally believe. I mean, I think right now Republicans are actually slated to barely hold it on 51-49. And yeah, Democrats picked up 14 seats. Um, I'm not going to go into all these races, though, but I mean, some of these were notable, like in uh, District 12 here, District 13. Where, and, I mean, Republican the Republican incumbents that were in tight races just ended up getting blown away. And Republicans that were favored to win are either barely hanging on or just narrowly lost themselves, so... I mean, th now granted, there was uh, there's some uh, exceptions here, like you know David LaRock here. Uh, he actually ended up winning uh, th again, but it w it's but a lot of these delegates, um, or Republican delegates. I mean, that that had challengers. Uh, generally, I mean, a lot of them in tight races ended up losing. Only very f very few of them actually ended up uh, winning. And Democrats could retake the House of Delegates for the first time in, I want to say, 20 years? I think the last time they held was, they, well, they had a tie in 97. Uh, I think before that they had a majority. I'm not 100% sure on that, but it's been a while since Democrats held the majority there. And I think in the next few years, personally, I think that, you know, um... In 2019, Virginia sends up, up that will violently go back to violently go to the Democrats. I predict that again, um, whoever will be Mark Herring uh, he, or Justin Fairfax, that will be elected the next Democratic governor, and then the House of Delegates will firmly go to Democrats, and it will be a hundred percent complete Democrats. And then in the 2020 recensus, keep in mind that you know Republican delegates here. Uh, that, not delegates, the actual congressmen uh, will probably, I mean, several of them will probably lose, like Rob Whitman, whose district is uh, over here. Uh, Scott Taylor's in, now in pretty much a lot of danger. He represents the area right, right here around Norfolk and the Virginia Beach area. Uh, Dave Bratt, who is right about here, he's in trouble. Um, yeah, I, and uh, Tom Garrett, who's I think his district goes like this. I I mean, yeah. I, I mean, the only people who are not in trouble is uh, Morgan Griffith, whose district is right here, and Robert uh, uh, Robert uh, Goodlatte, whose district is right here. I think that I think those two are going to be safe for. Uh, pro I think those two will probably be for, uh, lifers. They'll be there until they eventually step down, or if they somehow get primaried, but. Every other Republican congressman is basically – or a Republican representative is at risk, especially Barbara Comstock, who actually – her district is basically this area right here. I'm pretty sure she's going to lose. And I think this is – this was a harbinger for what's to come in 2018 because this race was partially driven by anti-Trump. Trump's approval rating was 43%. Uh, in Virginia on election day. Now, granted, that's higher than some polls had it, but still, it's pretty bad. Cons if you look at the, at the historical context, like Obama had a 46% approval rating in Virginia four years ago, and he his party still were, actually gained the governorship. Obama, like I think, had similar approval ratings uh, in 2009 in the state, and Republicans won that by double digits, and that's because. And, and the reason Republicans won 2009 because of that strong anti-Obama sentiment, and now there's an anti-Trump sentiment building again across the. And Virginia is a prime case of that. Virginia has was uh, the battleground for it, and the Democrats showed that real the Democrats are trying to realize that you know after all these uh, close special elections like in Kansas and Georgia. And all and then Montana, and um, uh, I think that's the only three. And in South Carolina, that like they realized, hey, we can actually win this thing. So they drove out in 
in in presidential like turnout, and they wallop the Republicans who, who again Donald Trump has not achieved anything except getting some conservative justices appointed and Neil Gorsuch's Supreme Court, and Congress uh, again hasn't hasn't really done anything significant either with failing to repeal Obamacare and the uh, ah, tax reform at this point looks sketchy, 50-50 at best I would say, but we'll see. I guess we'll see how that, that turns out. But, again, it is not looking good for Republicans in coming up next year. And the polls were, I mean, generally they, they undercounted the Democrats. And let me just show you the 2018 generic ballot. This is basically 2006-like numbers where, you know, after Bush won re-election, Democrats consistently held the, the lead in the generic congressional ballot. I mean, yeah, the lead has varied, but... You get the picture as you start looking at these numbers. It's not good for Republicans. And so Republicans are faced with a damn you do, damn if you don't choice. On one hand, if they cut Trump, then all the Trump the Trump section of the GOP is going to get triggered. They're going to say, oh my god, you're a globalist puppet rhino. And they're not going to support uh, that GO the GOP act that may even vote for the Democrats because they don't give a shit about winning election. They only care about Trump at this point. On the other hand, if they embrace Trump fully, like how Steve Bannon wants, well then, you know, you turn you get Virginia, but on the national scale. And this on the national scale would translate to losing both House chambers of Congress. Uh, you know, Dean Heller would lose in Nevada, in which at the, the rate he's going, he's probably going to lose in Arizona. And if we nominate a crappy candidate, we're going to lose Arizona. And uh, and I and then I don't think I don't think Democrats are going to get anything else out of the Senate map, considering how awful it is. In fact, actually, I'll just pull up the Senate map right here. But I mean, they're they're just really I mean, because the Senate map is so blue, the the Democrats can't really conceivably take control of the Senate. They can at best make it a 50-50 tie, and they would have to have a, they would basically have to have a miracle for them to flip the Senate this cycle. I mean, and if they get, you know, it could be in Tennessee with, if they get former Governor Phil Bresney who left office with like something like a 70% approval rating, who was a Democrat in a red state, I mean, sure, Democrats may have a chance there. But again, Republicans do have some decent uh, 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 chances in states where Donald Trump is actually popular, like in Missouri, Indiana. Uh, I don't know if he's still popular in Ohio. Um, you know, he's popular in Montana, popular in North Dakota. So I mean, Republicans do have a chance to counterbalance like losses in Nevada and Arizona, but it would probably be a net gain of something towards zero, depending how things go. So. Uh, and so that's just why I started with this tweet, because it shows that Trump is so tone deaf at this point, and his p section, the party, is tone deaf. And I'll explain what, what I mean by his section. Yeah, you can read the tweet for yourself. I'm not going to read it. But again, Gillespie ran the campaign he thought he had to win. He he knew he couldn't fully embrace Trump, because if he did, he probably would have lost by like 20 points or so. But if he, if he didn't fully embrace him then he wouldn't have gotten the turnout, and he still may have lost. Anyway, so Gillespie was probably in the lose-lose situation after Trump won. If Hillary was president, Gillespie might... It, this story could be could totally flipped. Gillespie could have actually ended up be winning. He could, could have been the governor. But the thing is, Gillespie felt compelled to run, run on Confederate monuments and hardcore anti-immigration, particularly very hard on illegal immigration, which is personally fine if you're a Republican, but it just did not resonate. The message, while it res resonated in Trump's base in Western Virginia and Southern Virginia, it didn't actually, it didn't, it turned off people in Central and Northern Virginia, which is where you need the votes there. That's where, that's where things get decided. And now I'm not trying to diss Western or Southern Virginia, I guarantee people, there's, there are people who live there, but I'm just saying, just vote the votes wise the the votes are in central and northern virginia that's the places that decide these statewide races and right now democrats have the monopoly there 
And in fact, Dem Virginia is probably going to be becoming more and more Democratic in these years. I, I, I actually joked about this. Virginia is probably going to vote Republican again by the time I'm like 80. And, uh, you know, I'm 18 now, so, you know, you do the math. So, but this represents a lesson for Republicans as well. It's like, do we embrace Trump or do we distance ourselves? Now, personally, I am no fan of Trump. To get, being honest, I say cut him loose and just embrace and just deal with the losses in the short term. In the long run, you can rebuild the party. Are is Republicans are Republicans going to do this? Well, probably not, because two because at least two thirds of the of the party um, are behind them. And this is when I get into sections. So you have. I, before Trump, there was two parts of the GOP. There was the Tea Party and the, the moderate establishment. And that was going on since, that fight's been going on since 2010. And it probably, and it largely ended after 20, around the 2016 season with the rise of Trump. What Trump did was he exposed another faction within the GOP. And this is, and it, it was a cross section between moderates and Tea Party voters. And those are the like I would like call the nationalist, populist, hardcore anti-immigration side. Because there, are, I know Tea Partiers who don't like Trump, who think he's a rhino, and I know uh, and there's plenty of moderates that don't like Trump. But there's that, but there's that, that cross section where there, where there's where where uh, those two sides meet, and that's the section that Trump appealed to and won. And, and the establishment. I mean, granted, they may not love Trump, but they, they for whatever reason, they think that okay, just because uh, you know populism won, that it's going to be the winning message. So they're going to be behind them. And then there's, but I mean, the, the establishment the, and the Tea Party. I mean, they just like his you know anti-establishment style. But there are sections within those sections. You know, it, it's starting to sound really complicated. I know. But there are sections within the establishment and sections within the Tea Party that collectively represent, a, like, I don't know, like, maybe 20% total of the GOP that, like, are never Trump. And, you know, it's hard to, to pin down, like, where, where you know, they collectively stand together, but they are no, no fans of Trump. And, you know, unfortunately, collectively, the Republican Party still stands behind Trump, even though they're starting to slowly sour on him. But it might not be enough by the time it's 2018, because all the Republican candidates in key races are going to have to face the litmus test that's being pushed by Steve Bannon and his right-wing Breitbart crap site. You know, they're going to say, are you loyal to our Lord and Savior Donald Trump? And if they don't, like, answer enthusiastically yes, well, then they're going to have a hard time winning the primary and even winning the general election. Again, Trump cares about loyalty. He doesn't care about, like, his party winning in an election. He, I mean, he'll only get involved if he thinks that in the end it will benefit him, which is why he kind of threw it, he made that tweet throwing Yeager Gillespie in the bus soon after the results were finalized. I'm just, and the Republican Party right now, the, I mean, yeah, there's some top leaders that have called out Trump, but it's not going to be enough. They have to, I mean, the thing is, for Republicans to, to, re, to regain their old status, they have to literally wage a war against Trump. And that right now, that is not a fight they would win. And I think they probably know that. And that's why Trump will probably not be pr successfully primary, because... For whatever noise, all the noise John Kasich and Ben Sass and Jeff Flake and Bob Corker can make to the broader Republican Party, they don't care. They only care that it's just their Lord and Savior Trump up there and that they blame Congress for everything because it's easy to blame Congress. And even though Trump doesn't know how to govern at all, it's always Congress that gets the blame. So Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan will have a hard time, uh, you know, trying to push through anything substantial because Trump's views are so fluid that he's willing to even like just work with Democrats outright. And did the Trump base care? Not really. No. As long as they per they somehow as Trump somehow spins it as a win for Trump and his Make America Great Again fan base, well, that's what's gonna be. But now, is Trump going to win re-election? Well, 
he conceivably could. I'm not saying it would be it's he's he's a slam dunk to win re-election, because the Democrats have been like, you you've seen how how far left that the Democrats just face plan themselves into after the election. They they they've all basically become the next socialist party here in here in America. They're social. They're, they're, it's like they're not really socialist, but it, I mean they're it's basically a good chunk of their party is already socialist. So I mean, what are you gonna do? And it's because the Democrats have run so far hard left because they hate everything Donald Trump stands for. So, for example, Donald Trump supports A, while Democrats are going to run to Z and drag the American, the, the whole American public from the center, which we're going to say it's K, to closer to the Z, which in this case it will be, it will be something like, um, like T or S. The Democrats are going to, are do, because of the whole anti-Trump ap- ap- apathy, and because Donald Trump is so unpopular, he, the Democrats are going to try, are going to drag the American voting public to the left. So, which means it's going to be a very bad time to be a Republican running for office in the next few years. So, which is why Republicans are probably going to lose Congress, and Trump will will probably lose. Re- well, I mean, again, he probably won't lose re-election because if Democrats have a total, complete meltdown, like they have an insanely divisive primary where they just nominate someone who literally can't win, they nominate another Hillary Clinton, then maybe, yeah, Trump could win. But again, if the election were held right now, he would not win a re-election. And a lot could happen between now and 2020. Maybe Trump can, rec- well, you know, start changing or he, or, you know, he'll become more disciplined or the Democrats will have a fallout, have a major fallout that turns the American public back to tr- to the to the right. Are any of those things likely? Pfft, no, probably not. But it could still happen. I mean, stranger things have happened in uh, recent years, and we've we're, we're seeing that unfold right now. And post twenty twenty, if Trump does lose re-election, well, then I think the whole cycle will probably start again. Because I would imagine Democrats will more, will probably nominate someone closer to Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, but not like like enough that candidate wouldn't be enough to alienate all those suburban moderate voters who hate Trump but will decide, you know, screw it, it's time to vote him out. And so, you know, they'll vote they'll vote for the Democrat in that instance. And then, you know, the cycle repeats itself, you know, the Democrats will go farther left, and then the American people will realize, well, okay, this is too far for us, let's go back to right. It's never-ending pendulum, so you can think of it. it. You saw it with Obama, you saw it with Bush, you saw it with Clinton, you saw it with the first Bush, and Reagan, and so on. It's a pendulum, so to speak. Event, and yeah, the pendulum is swinging left now, but... You would, th- but Republicans are hoping that, yeah, hopefully that's gonna swing back soon. And 2017 is gonna be the, is the point where it starts marking that the pendulum has officially entered the left side of the, the whole political spectrum. And uh, the, I don't think anything's gonna stop it, stop the fur th- it from uh, swinging harder left. So. If you're a Republican, the best you can really hope for is hope that the, the losses in 2018 are at a minimum, and that you know that key governors like Larry Hogan and Charlie Baker, and you know key and Scott Walker and key races like Florida and uh, the Nevada and all across the country. You know, you're you're gonna hope that you know that your those candidates can win. So. That they it could pres- preserve the viability of the Republican Party long term, because Trump is and Trump and his nationalist base are just shrinking the appeal of the party. It's becoming the party of Trump. <coughs> and Republicans will again are going to have to face are going to have to face the mirror at some point and say, "Is this what we're really about?" And I fear personally that they they've already done that and said, "Yes, this is what we are now." So, maybe it'll, it'll change. Maybe it'll change. It'll, uh, hopefully, will change after Trump. And just, I'm just gonna go on the record. I'm not voting for Donald Trump. Don't even try to get me and get me started. Now, I imagine if anyone watches the video, yeah, I mean, what they are probably gonna disagree with a lot of what I'm saying, and I'm personally fine with that. I mean, disagree with me all you want. 
But that's just my take on how everything is and how everything stands, and that's, I guess, the way it is. So, thanks for watching. Um, you know, congrats to the Democrats, though, for a pretty good showing in 2017. You know, I love it when people vote. I, I love seeing people vote. And, you know, they made some pretty historical wins in 2017. So, you know, good for them. And um, just best, I, all I can say is just best of luck to you guys next year because you'll probably need it. So, thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And I will see you guys whenever I make my next video. So, yeah, bye.